everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my partner in crime, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. Weston and we are here to talk about Packers Cowboys in the NFC wildcard round. It was a 48 to 32 victory for the Green Bay Packers. That final score does not really indicate how this game went, and we will certainly get into that. But the bottom line is this there are four teams left standing in the NFC looking to represent the conference in the Super Bowl, and the Green Bay Packers are one of them. Who'd have thunk it, Michael? <laughs> Who would have thunk it? I mean, the Green Bay Packers, the team that so many people had counted out at so many different parts of the season, here they are in the final four in the NFC, the Elite Eight of the NFL, and a well earned well thought out victory I, I love the game plan I love the execution it was multiple phases of the game coming together for what would I think honestly could you could call the most dominant victory of the season for Green Bay yeah no question about it I mean this this game was uh 27 to nothing late in the second quarter when Darnell Savage took that pick six to the house it was 48 to 16 with 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter, a 32-point lead on the road. Dallas's 16-game home winning streak that had dated back to week one of 2022, that was wiped out. The Cowboys' season is over. The Packers are moving on. And the number of, uh, the number of stars in this game is uh, um, it's a long list, but it certainly starts, in my opinion, with Jordan Love. His playoff debut, first game as a starting quarterback in the playoffs, and all he does is put up a maximum passer rating of 158.3 until a, an incomplete pass late in the fourth quarter dropped it to 157.2. Three touchdown passes. Jordan Love was absolutely in command and was masterful in this game. One of only five incomplete passes he threw against the Cowboys, but even more impressively, 16 completions for 272 yards, 151 of those going through Romeo Dobbs. Jordan Love, and I wrote this in our Insider Inbox column, if you want to go check that out for Monday, or Tuesday, rather. Mike, it didn't matter if Dan Quinn blitzed him. It didn't matter if Dan Quinn played coverage. It didn't matter if they loaded the box, if they played two safeties back. Every single time, Jordan had an answer for it. And you were the one that pointed this out, and I know it's been a thing making the rounds in social media this week. His mastery of the line of scrimmage and his use of cadence to get defenses to kind of disclose what they're doing. I don't know if that's a teaching point with the Green Bay Packers. I don't know if that's something that Aaron Rodgers kind of taught him. I'm not sure if that's something that Jordan's just done all his life. But as a first-year starting quarterback at yeah. 25 years old, you could have. I, I would have thought it was Joe Montana out there, the way that he was commanding that thing. He was poised, confident. He was cerebral. And man, oh, man, when he needed to make some big-time catches, he made them in this ballgame. Yeah, and when – the Packers started the game just the way you'd like to. They took the ball 75 yards down the field, took almost eight minutes off the clock, caught one huge break on that drive, which was on the second play of that drive. Love had gotten sacked. It was looking like it would be third and 12, but an illegal contact penalty on the Cowboys on one of the Packers receivers downfield wiped out the sack, gave the Packers a fresh set of downs uh, at the 30-yard line, and then from there they went 70 yards with uh, without much difficulty. And a lot of that was built on running back Aaron Jones, who, um, let's face it, AT&T Stadium is, has become his personal backyard, I guess, as far as playing football. He's got seven rushing touchdowns in that stadium in his last two appearances there, three of them here in the playoff game, which tied – the Packers playoff record for a single game. He also set the Packers career playoff record for rushing touchdowns, 118 yards, his fourth consecutive 100 yard game, including the end of the regular season, Aaron Jones. And quite frankly, the, the, the stick to itiveness with regard to the run really paid off here because I thought the Packers offensive line, uh, kind of got smacked a little bit on those initial plays really early in the game. But once that group settled in and with Matt LaFleur sticking with the run and Aaron Jones starting to gash the Cowboys a little bit, that's when suddenly everything opened up on offense. And as you said from the very beginning of this thing, this game is so predicated on momentum. 
And I thought, I, I love the way that Dallas started this game. They were physical. They were hard hitting. Dan Quinn was stacking the box. They were challenging Green Bay to run the football. Yeah, the, be- and, the beginning of the Packers' first two drives, it looked like Dallas was the one controlling the line of scrimmage. But it didn't last long. No, and, and being able to go seven carries, 25 yards, and well-earned yardage was so important for this thing because you saw, Mike, as it built up the confidence that Aaron was running with, but also just the core around him, whether it was the offensive line, the tight ends, the receivers, everybody was doing their job with the blocking. And there was one moment, it was a very small moment. I don't know how many people were able to catch it on television, but it was right before the two carries for 37 yards that ended up rupturing into the, the Luke Musgrave touchdown, I believe. The, play, the series begins, Aaron Jones is literally grittying his way to the huddle from the sideline. He's basically dancing his way onto the field. <laughs> he was feeling it. Yeah. And I don't know if that was just how at home he feels there. He had 24 tickets for family and friends at that game. Obviously, we know the backstory with his father. One of the most iconic photos that's ever been taken of Aaron was with his dad kind of leaning over the, the stands there, giving him a hug before one of those games against the Cowboys. Whatever the magic is there for him, the guy was completely in his zone. Four straight games now of 100 or more rushing yards. Up until two weeks ago, he never had back to three consecutive games with 100-plus rushing yards. The Green Bay Packers needed Aaron Jones to be a superstar for them down the stretch, especially with this injury to A.J. Dillon. And my, oh, my, the 29-year-old guy is looking like a kid again. And he's got a heck of an accurate arm. He threw a strike yeah. to his twin brother with that one touchdown ball there in the uh, in the stands. I would have taken Dallas. out probably a, a, like a pregnant woman accidentally <laughs> if I would have tried to throw that pass. I'm telling you right now. Because the other thing was, he was still kind of running when he threw it. That was sort of a... You know Lamar Jackson play there yeah. by him. But. Yeah, he was on the move for sure. Well, him. you mentioned you mentioned Romeo Dobbs earlier, and it's definitely worth talking a little bit more about this performance because, for as much of uh, you know the 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 rock and the consistency and everything that Romeo Dobbs has brought to this offense, particularly this year in his second season, he had yet to have a 100 yard receiving game in his career, and he had his first not just on a playoff stage and not just 100 yards, but 151 yards. On just six catches with a touchdown, it was big play after big play to uh, to Romeo Dobbs. And for those who want to take a closer look, I actually broke down all of all six of Dobbs' catches in the game. They're in my "What You Might Have Missed" piece. Um, just lots of really interesting little things to see on film with regard to how those plays worked. And then I also broke down the touchdown pass to uh, Dontavian Wicks, which uh, which reflects the Jordan Love's command at the line of scrimmage we were talking about earlier. But with Dobbs. Um, the Packers had gone, what was it? 14 games without a 100 yard receiver. And now in three of the last four games, they've had a hundred yard performance by three different guys. First, it was Bo Melton. Then it was Jaden Reed. And now it's Romeo Dobbs. This, this Packers receiving core, they, they are proving it's, it's not just some kind of a cliche. It's not just a fun thing to say. This Packers receiving core is proving any one of these guys could go off and be the star at any given time. I mean, next this next week against San Francisco, it could be Christian Watson. It could be Dontavian Wicks. Yep. Who knows? And that is functioning as a major strength for this Packers offense right yeah, now. Yeah, and as Matt LaFleur said, you know, Jaden Reed didn't have a catch in this game. And if and I saw him in the locker room afterwards. He was – you could have thought he had another 112-yard game. <laughs> yeah, Just LaFleur how mentioned excited, that as well, yeah. Yeah, that group has been for one another. But – Bringing this thing back to Dobbs, Mike, because he is so understated, he is so about his business that it sometimes is easy to overlook what he's doing on the field. And this game, he made himself undeniable. Whether it was the routes he's running or the scheme, personally, my favorite story, even though it wasn't, you know, his 46-yarder was actually a new career long for him reception, but the 39-yard completion that they had there, the reason why I like that so much is it shows you how in rhythm and how in sync this offense is because... Matt LaFleur said he even purposely called that timeout before that to get Dobbs back on the field to run that play, and it ran perfectly for them. And it's just been moments like that with six catches, 151 yards. 
I was talking with Dontavian Wicks about that in the locker room afterwards. He said, you know, this is no surprise. This is what Rome does. And because there is so much variance, there is so many dynamic players out there in that receiving core, you sometimes can forget that this, this second-year guy who's still only, I think, 24 years old, he has so much football in front of him, even though he's played so much already. And in a game like this, really showed that, you know, he's a big time player. And, and in this particular performance, when they needed him, he came through in a huge way. Yeah, absolutely. And when you talk about the offense being in sync, you know, you, you, you look at the replay, you look at the film of these plays, you see Aaron Jones sticking his nose in there to help out in pass protection, throwing some key blocks, whether it's Demarcus Lawrence or whether it's Micah Parsons, you know, you see that, you see that kind of stuff happening. And Dobbs with all the big plays you mentioned, 46 yarder, 39 yarder. He had a couple 20 plus yarders in the first quarter. I think the most underrated play he made, perhaps in terms of the in terms of his impact on the game, and this is even aside from the touchdown that he got at the end of the game. After Jair Alexander's interception, the Packers got to first and goal from the six yard line, yep. but then got called for holding at the turn of the quarter when then they they switch ends of the field. So suddenly. The Packers are on the other end of the field, and it's first and goal from the 16. The game is only 7 to nothing at this point. First and goal from the 16 is a tough spot, and the Packers are looking at, you know, if, if you can't convert there, you maybe you only get a field goal. It's only 10 to nothing. You're only getting three points off of the turnover in the red zone. But on first and goal from the 16, it's like Romeo Dobbs, boom, slant pass down to the one-yard line. Suddenly, it's second goal from the one, and that penalty was erased. A big holding penalty is completely forgotten about. The Packers get the touchdown. They go up 14 to nothing. They were on their way. Yeah, and his hands, man. You and I have talked about that. I mean, his, he plays strong with his hands, and there's so many times, whether it's plucking the ball like on a slant like that or just going up and being physical at the point of attack and showing to the defender, no, this is my football. Uh, Romeo Dobbs does it all and and again it, it's so cool to see Dontavian Wick step up and Luke Musgrave step up and Tucker Craft emerge and obviously you've seen players like Malik Heath and Bo Melton have their moments too but so much of this a year ago was built around Romeo and and, and Christian and, and this young nucleus that they were building with this receiving core he's still been an impact player he still had some phenomenal games this year but just to see him have that career sort of defining moment and how humble he was about it afterwards really not having too much to say I just again I think it speaks to the duty is and, and by the way to correct myself still only 23 years old I, I almost put an extra year on him so <laughs> Rome's got a long way to go man yeah well we do need to talk about the defensive performance in this game because it was impressive and you can't look at the statistics from this game because the Cowboys, when they were way behind, they racked up a whole bunch of yards, got got extra points in the fourth quarter, all that kind of stuff. That's not what this game was about defensively for the Packers. This game was about specific moments defensively where the unit really came up big. I mentioned Alexander's interception in the red zone set up a touchdown. Um, you have Darnell Savage's pick six late in the second quarter where he just he jumped the slant route to C.D. Lamb. I mean, he just he read Dak Prescott's eyes and and Prescott, quite frankly, telegraphed that pass and Savage didn't miss it. He took it all the way. You had the early early in the game, I believe, second quarter, the Cowboys are are on the edge of field goal range, possibly in field goal range. And Keyshawn Nixon chases down Dak Prescott for a sack, pushes them out of field goal range. They have to punt. Um, and another, what I thought was kind of an underrated moment for the defense in this game, the opening drive of the second half, it's 27 to seven. The Cowboys have scored on the final play of the first half to get on the board. They get the ball coming out in the third quarter. They drive, they're driving down the field. They get across midfield. They're into scoring territory. And then Preston Smith swats that pass down on third down and forces the Cowboys to kick a field goal. And at that point, Wes, 27 to 10 felt a heck of a lot different than 27 to 14 if the Cowboys would have been able to finish that drive double up on either side of the half from 27 to nothing to 27 to 14 it still would have been it still would have felt like anybody's game at that point I thought the defense rose up in some really key moments in this game and 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 that's something they need to hang their hat on moving forward to San Francisco it's an excellent point because you remember at the end of that first half you end up having the the Anders Carlson missed extra point so that's where it gets kind of dicey if you end up getting two touchdowns 
and two extra points for Dallas. And there's still, what would there have been at that point? Nine minutes and 27 seconds left in the third quarter. That's an eternity. Yeah. And I even said, I remarked to my former colleague, Rob Domofsky, when we were in the halftime line to go get a, some ice cream, give you some background insight into life of a sports reporter. But I, I mentioned to him, I was like, hey, dude, I was here for 26 to three. You know, when, when Matt Flynn and Eddie Lacy led these guys back, I wasn't resting on any laurels at that point when he's no. congratulating me on going on to San Francisco. But that being said, the defense, when they needed big moments, they had big moments. Um, quickly, I'm just going to go through the four that you outlined. Jair Alexander, he mentioned in the locker room, five to six hours a day he was spending in the training room, sleeping in compression sleeve, you know, boots just to make sure that his ankle's good to go after he has that really unfortunate freak incident during the jog through on Wednesday. He toughs it out. He goes out there. He plays lights out football, gets his first interception of the season on that slant pass. And as you mentioned with the Romeo Dobbs slant with the, the final touchdown run there by Jones, turns that into seven points. Then you come back and get the Darnell Savage pick six. Mike, for my money, I've seen a lot of cool pick sixes in my life. That was probably the most aesthetically pleasing because Darnell was already he was in second gear when he caught that ball yeah and he was in the fourth gear by midfield yeah I mean and as I think it was Kenny Clark said it in the locker room when Darnell Savage is running in the open field and you see that grass in front of him no one's catching that guy and then he put it on cruise control 25 yards yeah. from the end zone because nobody was nobody was close to him he yeah. literally just waltzed across the goal line and you could just see the body language of that time of the the Cowboys oh yeah the air 100%. was out of the balloon in the stadium, and you would expect that when you go down 27 nothing. But that was, I th really felt like, there's going to be no Wayne Larvey daggers in the second quarter. You even lamented even the third quarter sometimes. I, th I thought I, th third quarter is still a little early. I mean, hey, like, like okay, I was, I was in college. I was in college, and I watched Houston and Buffalo, the 35-3 to game yeah. out at old rich stadium in buffalo that was 35 to 3 in the third quarter yeah. and the buffalo bills came back and won that game and eventually got to the super bowl that year so calling a dagger in the third quarter i'm sorry not my style we wayne wants to do it that's fine yeah. not my style wayne's, at all. wayne's the man we're just two peasants down here but <laughs> but that being said i really did feel, and, and darnell even acknowledged it afterwards at first he didn't want to take too much credit for it but he did acknowledge he's like 27 to nothing is a big deficit and yeah. guys were even riding him a little bit like hey celebrate more he's like we got two more quarters to play yet. yeah there was there was still left. a lot of football left at that point um you're absolutely spot on with the with the deflection from Preston uh Zedarius uh excuse me um Devondra Campbell also got credited for a sack at the beginning of that final part of that series too being able to stop Prescott after kind of a weird sort of aborted play but I got to mention this, Michael, because I really did feel like the Keyshawn Nixon play was one of my more underrated moments in this game because of how relentless Keyshawn was there. I thought that play specifically really spoke towards the defensive performance of this because, yeah, he got the sack, but if he misses that tackle, Dak's going to have some opportunities. He didn't allow that. Yeah, He was able to come through there two weeks after having his first half sack in his NFL career. He gets his first full sack and his first postseason sack and. Green Bay was off and running. Well, and I, th I thought the key to that play, and I was chatting with the fans in, in the live blog at the time, and, and a lot of the fans shared the same sentiment that I had, which is that Nixon was able to make that play because he was absolutely decisive. Yes. He did not hesitate. Yep. As, soon as, he, as soon as he made up his mind, I'm going after the quarterback here. I'm not going to... You know, I'm not going to be all cautious and see if he wants to pump fake or throw it. I mean, because Prescott tried to pump fake. It didn't matter because Nixon had decided, I'm just, yeah. I'm going, I'm going for the midsection. I'm going to try to get him down. And, uh, um, and he was able to get the sack, which pushed him out of field goal range. I want to bring up another thing that I hadn't realized until I was kind of looking back and, and processing the game. So Jordan Love hits the 20 yard touchdown to Dontavian Wicks, puts the Packers up 20 to zero. In a really strange, the, the way this played out, a strange sequence of events, Jordan Love leaves the field with a 20 to nothing lead. The next time he took a snap, yeah. it was 27 to 10. Yeah. Because there was the pick six. The Cowboys get a touchdown on the last play of the half. They drive down and get a field goal on the opening drive of the third quarter. So the game has gone from 20 to nothing to 27 to 10, and Jordan Love hasn't taken a snap. But then what happens? The Packers two drives in the third quarter, they go 75 yards in five plays and 75 yards in three plays. 
150 yards in eight plays and two touchdowns after that kind of weird layoff for the offense where they hadn't even been on the field. Like that just show that just shows you how everything was clicking and nothing was going to stop the Packers offense in this game. Well, like I said too, it was in that quarter that I saw Aaron kind of just dancing his way on the field. I mean, cause again, the offense was just feeling it and it didn't matter how long they were sitting, you know, on the seats and on the bench, they were ready to play and they felt confident in their plan. Kenny Clark also joked afterwards. He's like, yeah, it was, it was getting a little tight there in terms of needing a breather. Cause it was almost the opposite of some of these games where, Hey, the offense goes three and out. The defense got to go back out there. No green Bay was having so much success that the defense was continually put out on the field. Uh, and, and, Obviously, the offense just being able to make big plays and huge ruptures, too. I mean, for Luke Musgrave to come out uncovered on that play action after those back-to-back explosive runs by Aaron Jones, I asked Luke about that afterwards in the locker room, and he said, you know, those are the hardest catches to make because it's the ball is up there for just so long. There's so much time to think about it. He did everything right, though. He made the got the the, cra- the crazy thing when that play happened. The folks in the live blog were messaging me saying there was there was nobody within the camera shot. Yeah. When you look at the all twenty two, there's nobody in the. It's the all twenty two. Yeah. It was all one. Luke Musgrave was the only one who was even within the camera field of the all twenty two when he caught that ball. It was unbelievable how wide open he was. I don't do, uh, obviously, what you might have missed, but that honestly might be my favorite scheme of the season because it's a two tight end set with Bo Melton and Christian Watson both on the field two guys who run in the four threes yeah Bo Melton you want to talk about how much respect this guy has commanded in like four weeks since he's been on the practice squad he was the one drawing the safety to his side kind of running sort of a corner route and from the slot and there was just they didn't want to get burned by those two but now that you have a pair of tight ends like Kraft and Musgrave there's just so much to account for. Again, it's going to get kind of probably to be cliche to discussing how deep Green Bay is, but these are the type of scenarios you can kind of play with and the, the different combinations that Matt LaFleur and Adam Stenovich can work with in their game planning, and it's it's playing off in a big way for Green Bay. Yeah, well, I'll take care of a little bit of sponsor business here, Wes, and then we'll start looking around at the rest of Wild Card Weekend. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs, 50 years of better. All right, so the Packers become the first number seven seed in the four years of this current playoff format to knock off a number two. They earn a trip to the number one seed now, San Francisco, who uh, got the lone playoff bye in the NFC. And uh, and the Niners will be, you know, not only a bye, but they rested their guys in week 18 as well. So uh, they they will be uh, as rested and ready to go as anybody with uh, the Packers heading out to the West Coast. Interestingly, Wes, the Packers were the only road team on Wild Card Weekend to get a victory out of the six games. The home teams went five out of six um, with Houston defeating Cleveland. Kansas City defeating Miami, Detroit beating the Rams, Tampa Bay finishing off the apparently unstoppable collapse of the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, And there's one other uh, AFC game I'm missing in there. Um, Oh, and and obviously Buffalo winning at home against... Did you uh, come up with unstoppable collapse, or did you pull that from somewhere? No, I just it just came to me. That's a great line. (laughs) Sorry, that's the writer in me. Well, here, okay. Before we get into these games, th- this is this is this is something that's this is something that's worth sharing because you and I talk all the time. We say it on this show. We say it in Insider Inbox. It's it's a week to week league. All you can do is deal with what is in front of you. And I understand fans like to look ahead, and everybody wants to look at the big picture and all that. Wes, after eleven games this season, the Philadelphia Eagles were ten and one. The Green Bay Packers were five and six. If anybody had said at that moment that the Packers would be alive in the playoffs longer than the Philadelphia Eagles, you would have been sent to an insane asylum. But that's how insane, that's how crazy this league is. You just don't know where a season is going to go for one team or another team. Teams improve, teams fall off, teams plateau. They ride a roller coaster that they can't get off. I mean, 
every single season is its own entity and and where the Packers are right now and where the Eagles are right now is I think a lesson for everybody in terms of just how you have to yes it's cliche and it's boring but you have to take it one week at a time in this league the thing about the NFL is and you and I have preached this so much it's about improving throughout the course of the season if there would have been an in-season tournament for the National Football League Philadelphia would have probably been if not victorious, definitely in the running. But you got to play the 17 games. Yep. You have to handle the 18 weeks. And I'm not going to get into all the things that went wrong for Philly this year. Obviously, there's probably enough media on the West Coast or the East Coast, excuse me, that are going to do that. But the Green Bay Packers improved from week one against Chicago to week 18 against Chicago. In this game against Dallas, I thought they really showed where they've grown. And it's not just the players, it's the coaches too, understanding these guys, knowing what buttons to push, which plays to call, what the scheme is gonna entail. And I just, I really love the mentality that Green Bay has had during this. Philadelphia, man, I, I don't know if there's ever been a playoff team that was, again, the top wild card that went up against, you know, a respectable but not world beater in Tampa Bay. Yeah, the number four seed of the division champs. 32 to nine for a yeah. team that had, had won 10 of its first 11. It wasn't really a surprise based no. on how they finished the year. No, it really wasn't. It really wasn't. And and so the NFC, the defending NFC champions go from 10-1 and one to losing six of their last seven, including the playoff game. They are out. The Packers are on their way to San Francisco. Tampa Bay is on its way to Detroit. Um, as I like to say, I'm not in the business of tossing bouquets at division rivals, but I will say hats off to the Lions. 32 years without a playoff victory for that franchise, and they got it. They barely hung on 24 to 23, but a win is a win. They knocked out the Rams, a team that had been playing some pretty darn good football, I thought, heading into the playoffs. The Lions take care of business there. So they stopped carrying Williams too. They they yeah. finally took the ball out of his hands. Yeah, they were and and for, for all those who always wonder when we talk about, oh, you know, red zone and all these, you know, catchwords, this and that. The Detroit Lions stopped the LA Rams three times in the red zone and made them kick field goals three times and hung on and won that game by one point. That was the difference. Yep. Um, the difference in that game. So the Lions, having gone 30, 32 years without a playoff victory, 30 years without a home playoff game, suddenly now have two home playoff games in two weeks because the Packers knocked the Cowboys out. Yeah, and here's the thing I like the most uh, about the Lions and just the way this thing has kind of played out for them this season. That was a highly emotional game with Matthew Stafford going into Detroit. And people no talk about whether or not you could wear a nine jersey at the stadium, you know. And the emotions of Jared Goff as yeah. well, that that he, he, you know, leads the Lions into the playoffs, but then he's got to knock off his old team. And there was, you know, some obviously some bad feelings with the trade and how all that went down. And, and there, were, there, was a, there was a lot tied up in that matchup. But this is what I love. I mean, NFC Central, like, here we go. Back <laughs> in the day, the black and blue division here, holding up the, the stanchion here for the, That's for right. the two NFC. Of the, two of the four left standing in the conference from the, uh, from the, the old black and blue. But, uh, you know, Detroit, this is a great opportunity for them. Uh, they're going to have an opportunity to take on a, a Tampa team that I'm sure they feel pretty good about matching up with. And now you look at the San Francisco 49ers. We're going to have a lot of chances to talk about them later this week. But I made the comment in Insider Inbox that two years ago, the roles were reversed. Yep. San Francisco came in here, underdogs upset Green Bay in a cold weather game. They were the sixth seed, I believe, yep. when uh, when they came when they Same came. Same exact Green circumstances Bay. too, because of the Monday nighter, they came here on a six day week to play on a Saturday night and there they go. But uh, it was a fun overall Super Wild Card weekend. I had a really good time with the games. I unfortunately, as I told you in our pre-production meeting, I fell asleep in the second half of Philadelphia and Tampa because I didn't really sleep a lot the night before. Um, yeah, we got uh, we we got we got back from Dallas quite a bit later than we had planned. I lost uh, I lost a fair amount of sleep on Sunday night as well. <laughs> that was uh, that was that was a for for a two what's supposed to be a two hour flight hey. from Dallas back to Green Bay. That was a long travel evening. Did I tell you I had a flat tire when I got back to Green Bay? No, you did. Your car wasn't was parked not that far. Why didn't you say something? Because I got it over to Quick Trip. I oh, well, oh, okay. yeah, I, I, I can. Say oh, the one right yeah. by the airport there. Yeah, yep. I okay. got it over there, inflated that thing, got it back home, figured it all out. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, good. I got. I turned on my car, so it's like it's what one degree outside. It took it took me it took me like twenty minutes to get my car scraped yeah. off to be able to drive it home. That was so, we ca- we came back to the deep freeze, and for it sure. was the permafrost. Like there's oh, different yeah. types yeah. of like yeah. you know <laughs> no doubt fr- freeze over your car. It was the permafrost one, the one where it's like you almost need a match just to get the stuff off your windshield. <laughs> but so I get in my car, and this has nothing to do with Packers unscripted. I'm sorry, humans, but. I get in my car and I got, I didn't get the check engine light. Cause usually it's always, you worry about the check engine light. I got the exclamation mark. Yeah. I don't ever get the exclamation. Yeah. Mark. The, the, it, tire, the tire pressure. And it, it tells me the back. It's like, Hey, low tire pressure. I look, I was at like 15 pounds of tire pressure Oof. in my back right tire. <laughs> so there I was at like two in the morning over at quick trip. Great. And it, it always happens in the cold too. Yeah. That's, that's the way, that's the way these things go. But we have another road trip coming up. We, do. we will be heading to San Francisco on Friday. The game is Saturday night, primetime under the lights in Santa Clara. We will preview the heck out of that game on our next episode. We'll look uh, look ahead to all of the N- the NFL divisional playoff matchups on our next show, unless you have any other thoughts before we're we doing say another goodbye. pep rally too. We are doing another at pep the patio, rally. Yeah. which is where we did our last one. Yeah, pa- Palo Alto is that yep. where we're going to be for the pep rally? Yeah, so that like, was a great one. I think Jordy was at that one. Uh, one of my all-time favorite moments. So I got a chance to meet Alan Lazard's dad there, Kevin. Okay. Great human being, awesome okay. gentleman. And a lady came up and interrupted us to ask if he was one of the alumni. It's like, no, it's my, my son plays for the team. That's <laughs> that's it. That's why I'm here. But uh, yeah, this one I think it's going to be what Tony Mall and Desmond Bishop. Desmond Bishop, yeah, and Mike Spofford, which is always <laughs> yeah. what's most exciting. Yeah, and Tony, if you're out there listening, I'd love a bottle of that Three Fat Guys wine that you and uh, Darren College and Jason Spitz, your whole venture out there. I know you're the guy. I know you're the guy in charge of uh, the Three Fat Guys wine. My my wife would love a bottle of that. Can you bring that back with you? I don't even know how does that I don't, work. I don't know. You have I to don't. ship it. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll have to do that. Or, so yeah, Tony will set me up. This has been a great episode. This has been our best episode of Unscripted yet. Hey, the Packers are playing playoff football, baby. It's, this it's is the exciting. playoffs. It's the playoffs. The Packers are still going. We're going to preview the next game on our next episode. And with that, we will sign off on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team. It's divisional playoff week here in Green Bay. We're hitting the skies on Friday. Saturday night is the next ball game for Wes. I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We will see you next time.